Thanks for, um, thanks for not crying. Uh, so two things before I get started. One is, all the things he said were definitely true. Um, if you've got somebody in your life uh, that's potentially a dean of students and could be a problem, you could, one option is to marry their daughter um, and kind of pave a better path for yourself. Also, uh, thanks Patrick so much for that message. And also thanks for bringing a crowd because we've got like a, a thousand seats in here and usually seven people and so now we've got like 27 which makes it slightly less awkward. Uh, the camera can't see this and so we can do it like anything we want with uh, computers and make this place full which would be great including the choir behind me. Um, let's pray and then we'll get started. Dear God, what a task, what a task you put before us. And it is, it is a wild thing that the poverty of the words that we speak are somehow anointed and somehow they can give birth to something. We thank you for this uh, this gathering of preachers, future preachers, we thank you for Christ. We thank you for the bride, the church. As we listen to these words of Mark, pray that uh, pray that you would take what I have to say and bury it deep in the hearts of the people that are here and in my own heart. You would hear your words fresh, and that we would know that they are good and trustworthy. We pray all this in the triune name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I should also say, when I start, I come from a Baptist tradition, um, and I started going to do divinity to morning prayer. And so when we read scripture in morning prayer, when we finish the scripture, we always say the word of the Lord, and then everyone responds, thanks be to God. And in, in the halls, like if anyone's around that goes to morning prayer, you can, you can just shout that phrase, uh, the word of the Lord, and then someone, somewhere is going to say thanks be to God. Well, I preached at my church, and there's not really anybody who goes to morning prayer at our church. And I said, when I finished the reading, um, this is the word of the Lord, and then everyone just kind of looked at me. I think one of my friends who goes to school with me whispered, thanks be to God. So, I encourage you all, at the, at the end of this reading, um, as I say, this is the word of the Lord, to respond, thanks be to God. It's just a reminder of where this, where this comes from and what it means to us. So, a reading from Mark's Gospel. Uh, chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in the prophet Isaiah, See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, who prepare your way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. And John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And he proclaimed, The one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. This is the word of the Lord. A voice from the wilderness cries out, come home. Gather together in your hearts the old stories of God and listen well. The time you've been waiting for is here. The great and terrible day of the Lord has arrived. And the writer of Mark, he has need for few words as he opens his account of Jesus, the Messiah. I mean, his first sentence is not even, not even a full sentence. It's a fragment of thought. It's the beginning of the good news of Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. And the writer forces us to envision the larger image given here just in glimpses. I mean, this term gospel that he opens with, good news, it's loaded with conflict. For those living under the shadow of of the Roman Empire, this gospel is imperial language. The good news that was proclaimed at this time 
was that Caesar and Rome had been victorious in battle. And so, when the legions would come home after a, a victory, then someone would go before them with good news. That, that Caesar had consolidated power, right? And the region was stabilized by the violence of war, and that Caesar had brought peace by the sword. And then this, this title, the front end here, Son of God, this also comes from the same imperial tradition. Because at this time, who was the Son of God? Well, everyone knew that this was Caesar Augustus that was the Son of God. I mean, the poets, they wrote about his birth. This, this good tidings of great joy that a Savior has been born, that the Son of God has brought peace, imperial peace, Pax Romana. These terms are loaded. So when the writer of Mark places this imperial language at the front end of his gospel, of his story about Jesus, he's inviting the comparison between the way that the world understands salvation and then the way that God imagines it. This good news, it concerns the powers that sit on the throne. And it concerns all those who claim to be Savior, Son of God. But it concerns them only to say no to their legitimacy. And this story is about the arrival of Messiah Jesus. And all these non-powers, these non-gods, that they're in the process of being dethroned. And the no of the gospel, this is this over-against nature of redemption. It must be acknowledged because there is a lot that we need to say no to before we can say yes to this gospel. And from the very first words of Mark's story, we hear bundled up with the goodness of this news an implicit critique of all other claims to power. And if Mark's right, if the kingdom of God has come near, then God has unseated all other non-powers. I mean, is it any wonder that these people got themselves killed? This is great and terrible news. And it's a cry from the wilderness and invites the people to get ready. If the power structures of the world are being disrupted by the coming reign of God, it's going to take a new set of eyes to see what God's up to. So, so they follow the messenger's voice out into the wilderness to turn back to God. But this isn't the first time that God's challenged those who sit on the throne. Non-God's dressed up in divine language. The wilderness is once again calling the people of God to believe impossible tales of rescue and redemption. Because when Israel was too crushed by the heel of Pharaoh to hope for anything other than a bat full of bricks and a sea full of dead babies, God called them into the wilderness. And here God says, you are no longer Egyptian slaves because I have adopted you. And I will be your God for all time. And in that place, in Mount Sinai, God covenants with them. In the wilderness, they, they regain their ability to imagine life outside of Egypt, anything other than slavery. And then what's the movement of the people in our text here in Mark's Gospel? The people, they come from Jer the Judean countryside and from Jerusalem. They, they go into the wilderness to meet John. Why, why would they do this? Why would they leave Jerusalem? I mean, the Jews, they had been waiting for a long time for, for a deliverance, for some final act of God. And it had always been assumed that when Messiah came, that he would defeat all the Jewish oppressors, in this case Rome. And then he would set up his throne in the temple. And from there he would issue justice. And then the temple is in Jerusalem, 